Franklin expedition was lost more than a century and a half ago. Yet to this day, it remains one of this country's great mysteries. What happened to the crew and where do their remains lie? A new search is underway with the full weight of the Canadian government behind it. And this week, the person in charge is our guest. And hello, I'm Peter Mansbridge, one-on-one -on -one today with Robert Grenier, a friend of this program, last on here, what, seven, eight, nine years ago now. Yeah. Um, Robert Grenier is the Chief of Marine Archaeology at Parks Canada, in charge of now of the uh, search for the Franklin Expedition. But the name that some of your friends give you is that you're Canada's Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, even the minister use that expression uh, in August when there was the launch of the, uh, the project. I must say that for archaeologists it's not necessarily the most uh, appealing uh, qualification. But you've got a history of finding things and obviously... I hope it continues. And you hope it continues. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the Franklin expedition and why it's, it's this mythic thing. Uh, in, in terms of Canadian history. I mean, it goes back beyond we, uh, when we were even a country. And it didn't involve Canadian ships, it was British ships. Yes. Uh, but the search for it uh, has lasted for so long, cost so many lives, <coughs> involved so many people. Um, why is it so important to try and find these ships? I could give you many answers for Canadians, I think, primarily these ships, <clears throat> through their tragic endings and their dis disappearance, and as you said, the longest and largest search and rescue operation in mankind's history, led to the expansion of our territory because during over 36 expeditions in the ensuing years, British Navy, French Navy, uh, navies from other countries, individuals from other countries, search for Franklin and his men in this ship. And in doing so, <clears throat> these people are like surveyors. They map the area where they do search, are systematical, and slowly all the Arctic archipelago of Canada got to be known, got to be mapped, hence the expansion of our territory. So we are talking these days of uh, sovereignty over the Arctic, and in a way, uh, through his tragedy, Franklin and his men in his ship uh, help to create that. You know, we uh, tend to forget, for those who don't know the Franklin story, that what he was doing in Canada's Arctic was looking for the historic Northwest Passage. Yes. <clears throat> and ironically, he came very close to finding it, if we're right about where his expedition yes. ended up. <clears throat> or as one Inuit said in the, the movie, recently released movie, Passage, uh, dead men don't find things. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, yes, we owe them a lot. They were just at the door and uh, I think in a way they did locate, but they couldn't benefit. So it, it did open this whole era of exploration, followed by Amundsen and others who came in and they, then the, the beginning of trading between the white man and the Inuits uh, followed in the uh, first part of the 20th century. So this is a, an important era in the history of our country. What do we know for sure about the end? Um, we know the, the, voy the expedition started in the, the mid-1840s, but within two years, the two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, which are legend in, in terms of uh, storytelling of this expedition, um, became locked in ice. Yes. And Franklin had died. Very early, yes. Sick? We presume. They, uh, there was no, no attack, no enemies there. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the amazing thing, you mentioned the, the medical aspect of, of the Franklin tragedy. Uh, when the British Navy started to look for him, they went everywhere but where he was with his men and his ships because it was the worst place to go, and he did go there. He, only himself could explain why he, he did made that decision. But then it, it expand and expand, and in a way, the expansion of Franklin's uh, saga 
is in great way due to his wife, Lady Franklin. She made that story an international saga. And thanks to her, we have this mystery to solve now. She refused to listen to some of the evidence that was put forward about what had happened to her husband. Yes, I think one of my greatest heroes in the Arctic is John Ray, which is now celebrated with this recent movie and the, uh, the book it was uh, made from. Uh, John Ray found the evidence. It was indisputable. And during the Victorian age, they didn't accept that these people could have... Uh, use cannibalism to feed themselves. Well, these people were not in their right mind at the time. We know for, from a scientific verification that they had an extreme case of lead poisoning, which affects the brain and its function. Uh, Inuits uh, report that when these people were passing by, very tired, very weak, some of them were groaning like animals. So these were not human, normal human beings at the end. Anything can happen then. Uh, by that point, they had been, uh, they'd given up from their ships. They were walking inland. Yeah. And this was two, three years after they'd left. Yeah, so just about, just about one year after uh, Franklin died, the rest of the crews, under the direction of Captain Crozier, Francis Crozier, decide to leave the ships, go down south, pass across uh, Simpson Strait, and go down towards uh, Hay and uh, Back River, trying to reach some Hudson Bay posts along the, that river there. But seemingly, as far as we know, uh, nobody made it uh, to, to, to that uh, post. They all died on their way. <clears throat> no strength, poisoning, etc., etc. Uh, miserable weather, miserable conditions of walking. I walked there last summer myself on, on those land. These are not sandy beach of the uh, West Indies. These are rocky beach with boulders, small boulders, small rocks, sometimes covered with kelp and uh, mushy material, which when wet is very slippery. It's not easy. And they were carrying amazing material with them. Some things they didn't need. Like? <laughs> mirrors made out of uh, silver and uh, all sort of personal apparatus that in the north is not needed at all. But they were Victorian sailors. They had some standing to, to keep. And actually, uh, in some ways, it's a good thing they did because those are some of the clues that have been found in the, in the decades, centuries now since, that have started to pinpoint what happened to the expedition. Exactly, except these clues don't say much about the fate of the ships, right. which we are after. Uh, but these clues, yes, give a, a tell trail, a trace of their uh, whereabouts and uh, how they disappeared along these coasts. It, it, it's hundreds of kilometers. It's incredible what they did. We're, uh, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk about now the, uh, the search for those vessels and uh, how you're trying to decide where to pinpoint looking for them and what you expect to find if, in fact, you do find them. We'll be back one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> with Robert Grenier right after this. Almost 160 years after they disappeared into this unforgiving Arctic land, the mystery of what really happened to Captain John Franklin and his 128 men remains unsolved. There's lots of oral history of people finding skeleton here. Why did they all die? And why have so few remains ever been found? Has anyone ever exhumed this body? Nobody has ever dug in, into this um, grave, hollow grave. This is a grave of human remains, and no one's ever no one's exhumed it. The answer may lie with Louis Kamakuk, who spent his entire life searching for clues, trying to crack the world's most famous cold case. Well, now trying to crack the cold case, joining Louis Kamakuk is Robert Grenier, <clears throat> the uh, uh, chief 
archaeologist for uh, Parks Canada, marine archaeologist for Parks Canada, who's looking for the Erebus and the Terror, the two ships that the Franklin Expedition uh, were on. Um, you've actually started the real search last year under the auspices of the government. Well, Once yes, they started it's funding. the first time it's under the auspices of the government, and I was there with <clears throat> two colleagues. Uh, one was really running the show, uh, Ryan Harris. He's the one directing the underwater archaeology survey, assisted by uh, Jonathan Moore, who was in charge of the archaeological survey on land. This is a, an expedition that I was dreaming of for many years, I would say 10 years, 15 years, in, in a way, 25 years. I don't have the time to tell you the whole story. <laughs> but this story is so important for the history of our country and the history of the British Navy that it has to be done professionally. It has to be done for the right purpose, not for the glory of a filmmaker, a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. It has to be for the history of Canada, for the history of the expansion of our country through the North and for the Inuits also. And you just saw Louis Kamukak on this uh, last scene. We are so proud to have the official assistance and contribution of the Inuit testimony through his voice, through his knowledge. There are other Inuits over there in Joe in, in his uh, in hamlet, who have also stories to tell. There was a book published uh, not very long ago by Dorothy Eber in Montreal about testimonies also. So these people were witness of mm -hmm. that tragedy. Well, it's amazing how that oral history has withstood the, uh, all these years. I mean, John Ray, who you mentioned earlier, who was looking uh, for Franklin within years of, uh, of his disappearance, um, he trusted the oral history. That's how he came up with the determination that, in fact, cannibalism had been one of the last acts of the surviving members of the expedition until they too passed on. And today still, you trust it, the oral history? Yes, the, the problem with the oral history <clears throat> is not the, the inherent to the, the oral history itself, it's the interpretation of what is said. Everything, usually every, just about everything transmitted as a base of truth. The problem is how to interpret that in time, in space, in the recognition of the figure of people. You know, like for us, all Chinese people look the same. For them, most white people are tall and look the same. So what we found with a guy, the assistant of a guy like Louis Kamukak, he can tell us this place you're talking about that is related in this oral history, talking about this series of its, its myths there, called the fingers. He said, the guy who told the story cannot be there. He has to be somewhere down south because his territory ended up here. White men like us cannot understand this, you see. So I think it's what's fascinating in this uh, expedition, this project, is that we link a scientific research, archaeological research, with this oral history tradition. Well, you brought with you um, some of the relics that you found, and we got time to talk about a couple of them. So, uh, of what you've got here, in terms of what you've found so well, far, that may well have come from the Erebus or the Terror. Well, uh, you know, when a shipwreck lies somewhere in the water near a shoreline, traditionally, it tends to throw out some remnants, some pieces, some indicators to the adjacent beaches or shoreline. Mm -hmm. So. On the shoreline of some islands, in an area where the Inuit tradition relates that a ship was observed floating in the ice one spring during hunting time, we found <coughs> in 97, within the circle, stone circle of a tent, uh, copper sheets like this. Well, this is the ancestor of the anti-falling paint we found on wooden boats uh, years ago that are ba banished now. This is poisoned for uh, microorganisms or the pteridoworms worms we eat the wood. So these were used in the British Navy in other ships around the world. Uh, since we found these and we had ways to date them to the first part of the 19th century, 
there's not much possibility that these come from other uh, source than the Erebus or the Terror in a nearby environment. For Inuits, these were like gold. It's a metal that is flexible, solid enough, but weak enough to be work easily with the, the limited tools they had, maybe even shears that they, they could get on the ship. So uh, what was the, the main clue to make us excited is this fragment of copper sheets that we found in 1983 uh, on the site of the Bredalben, a ship linked to the Franklin Saga, mm -hmm. which sank in 1853. Uh, it was not One a British... of the ships that went looking. Yeah, well, participating, yes, in yes, the search, in the search. Uh, by providing coal supplies. Uh, what we got here is the same sheet, and very, very different, as you can see. Look at the size of these holes. These were the same holes here. Look at the size. So this is from a wreck lying on the water for 150 years, roughly. Mm -hmm. It's totally modified, transformed. This is from a floating vessel, as described by the Inuit's testimony. You see, mm -hmm. linking to your question before. Yeah. So what would the, the Inuit do with this? Because these were relatively easy to take off the hull of the ship. They would take them ashore and start to transform them. And what they do with them are ulus. Ulus are uh, knives in the shape of a quarter moon mm -hmm. with a handle. It's called the, the women's knife. They use it for all sort of purpose. And it's the classic there. And you can tell here the curve on an ulu blade. For them, this was priceless. To find many of those in the same area on just a few islands is indicating that there was at one point a source of that supply nearby. This one is from the bottom of a coffee, sh a coffee pot that could be very well used, be used in the first part of the 19th century by British uh, Navy sailors. <clears throat> and you can tell that an Inuit was trying to cut it again to make three olus from this uh, bottom, but it's too thick, it's very heavy. Their primitive tools couldn't do it. The mayor of Joe Evan, who was in our office uh, two weeks ago, Woody Ash, was fascinated by this piece. He held it in his hand for about 10, 12 minutes, turning it around. He was moved, I couldn't figure why. He said, Robert said, you see these marks there? Show that these guys had virtually nothing to try to modify this. It's like me, he said. When my father died, he left me two tools, two tools to work with. So these are from an era where nothing was present there, especially ships. Mm -hmm. Umiyak, they called them, a big, uh, a big uh, rowboat, these uh, Franklin ship. So what we got now <clears throat> is on this island, indicators that something nearby sank, which was holding these source of copper sheets. I want to talk to you about what happens next, but we've got to take one more break, and uh, we'll do that right now. We'll be back one-on-one -on -one with Robert Grenier on the Search for the Franklin Expedition right after this. And we're back one-on-one -on -one for final thoughts with Robert Grenier, uh, Chief Marine Archaeologist for Parks Canada in charge of the search for the uh, Franklin Expedition's two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Um, if you find them, and I think in your mind you've got a pretty good idea of where you think at least one of them may be on the bottom, um, what kind of shape would it be in 160 years the, the one we are looking for at the moment, with the assistance of the Hydrographic Service of Canada, led by Andrew Lasak, it's a, it's a ship that would have sunk in fresh ice, according to the Inuit testimony, indicating that it's not a place where the ice crush accumulate, like we see when the river frees up mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the spring. So it could be a ship very well preserved, that one. We don't know which one it is. Some indicators could be that it would be the terror. It doesn't matter. 
they were more or less sister ship. The other one would be more crushed by ice and it would be quite a distance up north. Uh, this one is quite described by several testimonies indicating that it float on ice, was clean, was a dead man on board, and they start to uh, strip apart some, some uh, material from it, possibly including these sheets, you see. So it would be interesting, and in this new discovery done by, I think, Dr. Battersby in England, uh, indicating that the source of poisoning would have been the desalination system on board, which was brand new, a new, it was an innovation, a large scale uh, system that was installed in the ship right before the departure. So a large volume of water, not only for cooking, but for the steam engine installed on board, which need fresh water, seems to have been the source of the heavy level of poisoning that uh, affected those people. Um, because the water is obviously so cold, that helps in the preservation of, of, of what's there, or no? Nobody has a cl clear answer on this. We found some Spanish galleon on the coast of Labrador, where the water is very close in temperature mm -hmm. to that water. And three of the worms, wood-eating worms, were active there. Not as much as in the West Indies, they are slower. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the combination of ingredients, of factors that would uh, stop the eating of the wood? I don't know, but we can say that all the wood we find on the shore, we didn't see any piece of wood which indicated attack by this uh, organism. So that's another reason why we expect the ship, if not damaged by ice, would be in very good condition. We're out of time, but are you going to find it? I hope so. It's my dream. It's a dream of all that team. I will leave uh, the scene pretty soon. These young people on the team will uh, continue the search if we don't find them in the next two years of the expedition. But I hope that within these two years, we will find some clues. Wow. It's been great to talk to you again. Thanks so much. Welcome. Also, thank uh, Evan Solomon, CBC News Sunday, for a clip from his documentary you saw earlier. Thanks for watching this week. We'll be back one-on-one -on -one in seven days.